as we had mentioned, Android updates. Uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, improvement for Android. So Android 10 has had the fastest adoption rate ever. 16% of all Android phones that are still in use um, in 10 months. Yeah, that's a nice and record a, for them. <laughs> it's just like hearing that, like I get the complexities of Android globally with, you know, certain oh, markets sure. obviously. But it's just like hearing 16% in 10 months when Apple's usually like 15% in like a month or two. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's, it's it's pretty unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that being said, Google has done a lot of work on improving this and it will continue to get much better. Um, so Android 8 introduced Treble. Um, Android 9 and that. 10 yep. have both introduced further features to continue to improve this. Mm -hmm. And Android 11 um, is introducing um, something that should help quite significantly. So for those that don't really know how um, Android works, Android is based off of Linux and has to deal with the Linux kernel. Now, normally there's a Linux kernel per device. Yeah, so right. your Galaxy S20 has a different Linux kernel than the BlackBerry versus the Note versus the LG phone that you have. Um, so all these different phones would have different kernels. And what Google is trying to do is make one generic kernel that is not necessarily an Android specific kernel. Like right now they have like a, Google has to essentially make the kernel give it to all these companies and then they have to essentially remake it for their devices. It's a really <laughs> complex and annoying and difficult situation. Yeah. What they're trying to do, and this will speed up development in a number of ways, both on Google's end because they have to do less work, but then on every other company's end because using a standard Linux kernel would be ideal because everyone would have more information. Right. Um, is that Google's working on a generic kernel image that would be based on a normal Linux kernel, not an Android specific thing. Interesting. And okay. Then the way that it would work is that this generic kernel image would have certain like modules for the hardware. And so that would be the specific device related stuff. And so Google can huh. give out this generic kernel image and then Samsung can kit in the, essentially the drivers for their camera and their CPU. Or yeah. Qualcomm can give them the CPU one, but they can throw in what are essentially just the drivers and make it work and be able to push out updates much faster because if you can update the the kernel image and the OS without having to change the drivers for the hardware, then yeah. you can throw that stuff out way faster. Right, right, right. And this is really going to help for security updates. Which is important. That's another area that Android's really lacking in. Um, and then just updates in general. But, you know, yeah. I guess here's my thing, though, is like the, the you know, uh, forgive my skepticism, but Google has been promising that that was going to be something that gets substantially better for almost a decade now. And like, it has, and though. It has gotten better, but it hasn't gotten as much better as they have let it out to be, you know, like, like. So it's let's still, look at it this like, way. With, with Android Oreo. After 28 days, their um, active users was like uh, not even 300 million. Yeah. With Android 10, in 28 days, their active users was a little above 400 million. Yeah, so that's an improvement for sure. But I don't know. I just, uh, I mean, I... I or sorry, I should I'm say 300 days, not... Yeah, I'm I'm a little off on the but it, it's like a almost doubling. Yeah, yeah, which is a big deal. But I just feel like I just I want to see more of this, and I'm glad Google's pushing it, and I hope this helps them really get in that direction, because um, fragmentation's a problem. But um, I don't know. Some of the moves that Google has made to try and help with fragmentation has also, in some ways, damaged some of what I used to like about Android so much, where you know that every phone feels. It feels the same. It feels more locked down than it used to. You know, there's there. It's more elegant, like Apple, and not as functional. I mean, that's a lot of that is more so on the the phone UI manufacturers. Design though. The that's phone not manufacturers. on yeah. Google, because like the only thing that Google really requires is like, like as far as design wise, is like mm -hmm. certain stuff be listed in the settings, and certain apps exist that have their icons. Like they right. don't. They don't have That's true. that yeah. much over that. What they've done as of recent to make changes is, you know, Treble that helps further separate the OS from the hardware. 
um, this generic kernel image that again further separates the OS from the hardware. Like that's really what it comes down to, is that Google is trying to reach a point where they can update Android and ignore the hardware. And the yeah. closer they can get to that, then the longer that they can continue pushing out Android updates for phones and the that's faster cool. that those updates can go out. Now, yeah. they're never going to be in a situation where they're even close to as good as Apple is when it comes to update well, yeah, speed. Yeah, that's just not ever because, something that can be expected. Yeah, because phone manufacturers push out the updates, not Google. Yeah, well, and but sometimes the carriers have to be dealt with too. <laughs> the carriers have to always. So yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, but anything they can do to separate from the hardware will at least improve the longevity and will also in some ways help the speed because if you're not changing anything with the code of the 5g radio or the 4g radio then mm -hmm. t-mobile is going to be less picky about the changes they're still going to look into everything but yeah. their focus is on network performance and stuff pertaining to their network mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they have to do a lot of testing on that and so if that just doesn't change from update to update they're going to care a lot less this is true yeah yeah Okay, well, hopefully it works out. Hopefully it's as good as as they project it to be. <laughs> yeah, my my hope is that we can reach a point where, like, within two more updates, it's 25% of users in 10 months. And then yeah, yeah. in, you know, a couple more updates, it's 50% in 10 months. And at yeah. the very least, if they can reach, let's say, 50% in a year, I'll just say, um, uh -huh. that's going to be such a dramatic improvement from what they've had. And that's going to help the, like, obviously Google has been pushing as many of the new APIs into <clears throat> Google Play services as they can. Right. But they're really limited on that. And a lot of apps will never really, like, fully take advantage of the new APIs for a long time because mm -hmm. it's going to be three, four years until phones can really, or, you know, most phones have that support. This is true, and if yeah, they yeah. can reach 50% in a year, then apps are going to get better support. And stuff right. like that. And that's really going to make a it's big gonna difference. It's going to help improve Android. Android a lot. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. So this one was interesting here. Uh, this next topic here. Um, yeah. So Uber basically just bought Postmates. Yeah. I like to say Uber eat, Uber ate Postmates. <laughs> um, Uber, I love it. I love it. So... Uh, now, this hasn't been approved. This hasn't gone through, but they've announced that they are trying to do this. Uh -huh. um, Uber has announced an all-stock transaction to purchase Postmates for $2.6 billion in yeah. stock. Um, what I think is a joke, though, in reading this is that Uber is trying to claim that Uber Eats and Postmates are complementary rather than, like, you know, competitors that they are. Yeah. Um, and they were trying to say this because they have different customer bases yeah that's how competition works yeah exactly well and, and the only thing that really differs is postmates is easier than pretty much anybody else to order literally anything from anywhere you can send them to a mom and pop shop to pick up a a, a creepy doll you left there and pay them for it. <laughs> like like you could yeah. do anything with them um but that's the only real difference and that's not what most people use it for of course and on top of that like again that comes down to just like competition yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, and that's been the thing the that's fact helped that set them apart. Yeah, and so it's like the fact that it's like there's features that Uber doesn't have doesn't make them complementary services. Right, They're yeah, competitors. Yeah. They're competitors, you use, absolutely. Most people will like use, use Uber one. Eats because a restaurant is on there or yes. use Postmates because a restaurant is on there. That like mm -hmm. That's like saying that Sony and Microsoft and game consoles aren't competitors. They're complementary because Sony has exclusives and Microsoft has exclusives. Yeah, it just doesn't, no. that's not how that is. No, they're very competitive. Yeah, so that was stupid. But, you know, the move makes me feel weird. I don't like to see more companies buying out more companies and more companies buying out more companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, Especially since when it comes to the U.S. food delivery um, market... 95-ish yeah. percent of the market is controlled by four companies. Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, and Uber Eats. So yeah. now we'll go from four to three if this gets approved. Yeah, which sucks. <laughs> which? Like, less competition. Yeah. We'll see what happens um, when it comes to when it comes to like the T-Mobile and Sprint merger. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about going from four to three in the competitive space. 
Um, now, obviously, that's a little different since that is essentially vital infrastructure, whereas yes. food delivery is a luxury in most Although cases. it's more vital now than it was before. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said most <laughs> but cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, even then, like generally going from four to three in any competitive space has been something our you know Department of Justice has tried to avoid. Yep. Um, and with the T-Mobile and Sprint merger, they made it so that um, T-Mobile had to sell certain assets to um, Dish so that Dish can build up and become a carrier. So we will right. eventually have four. Um, the way that Uber has talked about this merger happening is that essentially things would mostly stay the same, except that they would integrate. I think they would just integrate the restaurant and ordering platform internally. So theoretically, you could order whatever you can order on Uber Eats or Postmates would be on both. Right, okay. But otherwise, their pricing structure would be pretty much how they are now. You would still choose between the services. Um, I hate the way restaurants do their pricing on some of the services, though, too. It's because of the pricing that these companies charge, though. They no, charge I understand, yeah. 30 yeah. fucking percent to yeah. the restaurants. It's an awful lot. Um. You know, and I, at some restaurants, I've seen very minor increases. Um, yeah, but that just means but, they're eating the cost. That's even worse. Yeah, well, no, what I was going to get at was the, the one that's bothered me more is a lot of the places that have done very minor or no price increases, you get way smaller portions. <laughs> yeah. And that is even more irritating. And I would rather pay places, more. Yeah, and a lot of these places will actually give you larger portions if you order it and pick it up at the restaurant rather than using these services. They give right. you what you used to. Like they essentially internally have a different order size for yeah, certain food yeah. items based on where you're ordering it from. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it's it's frustrating because as a as like a user of wanting to purchase something from a restaurant you've been to a lot before and you're just maybe new to services like this or whatever, you order it and you get, you know, like 70% of the food you would have gotten the other time. And so like you're not you're not necessarily prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like that's and, it's, uh We've seen, you know, in response to the pandemic and how it's affecting the economy in the United States, there's been many cities, including Portland, Oregon, um, that just passed um, a temporary measure that limits the fees that can be charged to yeah. restaurants to 10% rather than 30%. Yeah. And then in addition to that, um, if you use these services and you use it for in-store pickup, a lot of times, times they were charging 10, 15% of the order, which is insane because you're just, yeah, a, it should be like the credit card fee plus a couple percent. That's it. Uh -huh. um, and so like in Portland, Oregon, near where we live, they've charged, uh, they've, they've capped it at 5%. Um, and that makes sense. But again, yeah. all of this is temporary just because they're yeah. trying to essentially utilize this as a stimulus to uh, restaurants that are really suffering right now. Yeah. Um, and they've done things like, you know, again, in the Portland measure, they made it so that um, like Uber or Postmates can't cut payouts to um, drivers mm -hmm. because of this. Mm -hmm. And so you'll probably in these cases see fees go up, um, right. you know, whether it's the delivery fees or it's the processing fees or small order fees at higher thresholds or whatever. But at least at that point, you know what's going to the restaurant and what's going to you more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like if a restaurant charges you – if they charge $10 and that's what they're expecting to get, like they get, they get more of that. They get, you know, nine mm -hmm. out of the 10 instead of seven out of the 10. Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. And, so, um, and I mean I think it's a fine time to do that because right now the delivery services are getting more orders than ever. So Yeah. yeah. Um, and like Uber, it's an interesting situation for them versus somewhere like Postmates where Uber – their core business wasn't the food delivery service. Their core business was Uber rides. Drives, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas the ride demand has dropped about 70%. Mm -hmm. So their core business is tanking. And so they're right now looking trying to, to like, figure try out and what merge to do. with Postmates so that they can have some money coming in. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Because from my understanding, Uber Eats, I mean, I don't think Uber Eats or Postmates are profitable on their own. I don't think so. But That's where less competition comes in is that they can jack up the prices and be more profitable. Yeah, which I have seen price increases since the virus, by the way. I've seen noticeable ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so interesting. Um, This next subject was interesting and kind of people were mad about it, but also like 
People are mad about everything. Everything, especially if it involves Epic, Epic Games. games. <laughs> yeah. So doesn't matter um, what it is. Sony announced, uh, and this is Sony Corporation, not Sony Interactive Entertainment. I want to specify that because it means that this is not just pertaining to video games. Yeah. Um, Sony has invested $250 million into Epic Games, which is only roughly a 1.4% stake in Epic. <laughs> For reference, Epic has grown massively as of recent because when Tencent invested $330 million in them before Fortnite had blown up, yeah, that was 40% of the company. Yeah, pretty now, insane. $250 million is one4 <laughs> That's really crazy. It's, yeah. it's remarkable, actually, to say the um, least. Now, first thing I want to say with this is this does not mean Epic Games are going to be exclusive to PlayStation at all. Yeah. Any potential ever dis you know discussion about exclusivity will probably not even take this into account. Yeah. Yeah. At all. This is meant to be a Sony wide investment. Um, and what I mean by that is you know like Unreal Engine, for example. Um, it's easy to think of that as a game engine because that's what it's primarily made for. Yeah. But if you look at something like The Mandalorian, made by Disney, obviously not Sony, but that show used Unreal Engine in its production. They actually used a game engine for doing their CG. Yeah, it makes sense. And so to, yeah. with Unreal Engine 5 getting even more advanced, and like apparently this deal came after Sony saw the Unreal 5 demo, and they were like, oh shit, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and so it's like if that demo that we saw looked that good running on PS5. Yeah, right. right. What can like proper video editing machines do if they want to do because like one of the things mentioned in this is um, real time 3D events. Mm -hmm. Well, if they can do some real time, much more complex rendering and then stream that stuff to people, um, you know, like game streaming for shooters, obviously trash game streaming for I mean games in general is not super good still. Um but if it's like a 3D like concert like Fortnite events and stuff, that's a little different. You don't need precise like super low latency. You just need it yeah. to not feel bad for walking around. Right. Um and as we've seen Epic get better and better and do bigger and bigger in-game events. Yeah. And especially during COVID, you know, if we can see, you know, maybe before the end of COVID, we see Sony work with some of their musicians on some kind of big Unreal Engine concert, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, Sony will no doubt end up using this for their movies and TV yeah. shows. Oh, definitely. Um, definitely. And then on top of that, no doubt, Sony Interactive Entertainment. I mean, they generally do a lot more in house engines. Um, only a couple of PS4 titles were or PS4 in-house titles were Unreal. Mm -hmm. But, it could but be Unreal more Engine of them 5 is a future. big step up from 4. Yeah. And so yeah. there's more of a reason to utilize that. And if they have this deal in place, then it might be easier for them to, at a lower cost, maybe take parts of Unreal Engine 5 for their engines. Right. Um, all these different things like that. But it's, it's a smart investment from Sony, I think, because uh, Epic is not going to stop growing. Like, yeah, sure, Fortnite... Is not as big as it once as it once was. It's kind of stagnated a little too, though. Yeah. It didn't drop off as like that drastically, really. Yeah, it didn't drop off anywhere near as much as other um, battle royales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. But even then, you know, like it, the fact that we're seeing concerts and movies and you know political discussions in Fortnite as major events is kind of crazy. Yeah, and it yeah, really shows the potential of the medium in long term. It does. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Very interesting. Um, and then speaking of Epic, our last topic uh, is something else that Epic released. This is, again, getting into production of stuff, but this is really cool. Yeah. So they released what they're calling um, Live Link Face application for uh, iOS. And what this is, is it takes advantage of the true depth cameras on uh, the iPhone 10 and 11 series and then the newer iPad Pros mm -hmm. to do facial animation in a similar way that you would normally have to do the mocap dots all over your face to do really like complex facial animations for games or for cg or whatever yeah and being able to record that with your phone and make it actually pretty damn good quality yeah um, which as a small developer that's a huge deal oh yeah to this to is going to be really yeah. nice for um not just for indie like game developers normally 
yeah. but for um like independent filmmakers that might want to make something interactive yeah um, yeah because we've seen like um one of the games shown at um sony's event uh was not actually made by a game development studio it was made by an animation studio that actually had made the really really cool looking majora's mask animation i don't know if you saw that a few years ago yeah i believe it did yeah yeah it yeah. was pretty amazing that yeah. team made a game that was at the playstation 5 event oh um, okay yeah and huh. it's like you know you have these like art teams or these like filmmaking teams that might want to get into animation they might want to get into you know light interactive games or more serious game development whatever but yeah these different storytelling mediums than just filming it and editing it. And that right. can be really difficult to do. And so anything to make that easier is great. Yeah. And absolutely. facial animation normally requires rigs, cameras, all kinds of stuff. It's a lot. Um, and what's cool is that they're making it so that it's not just like you just record the data and you can put that in unreal. They're making it so that you can actually utilize multiple iPhones in a, a rig and have one external device initiate recording so you can do um, a conversation and have it feel much more natural because they're sitting right there in front of each other. Yeah, right, right. And um, you, so you can do all kinds of things since you can, you know, run multiple devices from one external device. One command hmm. can activate all of that. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty yeah. crazy and amazing. Wow. I love so, it. Um, I, I really feel like Epic has, as of recent, done a good job at bringing really good tools to um, indie developers and indie teams in a much better way. You know, we've seen mm -hmm. how they they changed their fee structure for Unreal Five to be um, where you don't pay anything until you've made a million dollars in a year, which is just a lot, um, like insane. Yeah, and so yeah. it's like you pair that with this to make animation easier, which is a really difficult thing for a small studio. And then you pair that with um, some of the Unreal Engine 5 improvements like their lighting system and their uh, their uh, texture scaling and whatnot. So you don't have to spend the time to make LODs. You just get one asset for that item. Right, um, right. And it's like, you've now made animation, art, lighting, programming and finances all easier because of unreal engine five, like five and the external stuff that they're doing that's i think we're gonna see a lot of growth yeah, yeah yeah that's a big deal so wow and i, I mean they're doing a lot unity, of amazing stuff yeah i was gonna say unity must be like quaking a little bit in their in their <laughs> shoes because it's like they're they have a lot i mean i'm sure that they have a new version coming soon that they just haven't shown but it's like What's coming from Unreal compared to what we know of Unity now? It's like there's such a widening gap. Yeah, yeah, right, right. It's pretty amazing. So, interesting. Well, um, I think that was a, that was a good good final set of topics there. Um, that was Wordcast seventy seven. Everyone, thank you for watching. And uh, as usual, please you know subscribe, give us a comment, let us know what you think. Um, you know, let us know where where you're watching this, especially if you're watching this on a on a podcasting app or something instead of uh, YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. To yeah, see if, if you watch it on your podcasting app, let me know what podcasting app you're using because that's real confusing. Why is that? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Shush. If you're listening to it on a podcasting app, <laughs> please let us know because I'd be interested to know what, what you're using and where you know where our user base is. It's mostly YouTube-oriented right now, um, but it's definitely interesting to hear from you guys. And uh, as always, in the description, there'll be links to all the topics we're talking about here as well as to our Patreon, our website, and other stuff like that. So um, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you all in the next one. See ya.